Welcome to a special episode of Off the Menu. I'm Vincent Franchini from Tumblr House here with Charles Goulomb. As ever. So you just got a view of the front and back cover of the latest book published by Tumblr House. Um, some of you guys have sent in questions on what Tumblr House is. Uh, we're a small traditional Catholic publishing company that kicks out both fiction and nonfiction. But uh, truth be told, almost all of the nonfiction that we published is because of the direction you have led us. Me? Yeah. I won't be blamed. Uh, I, I first heard about Solange Hertz when you quoted her in Puritan's Empire, mm. the Star Spangled Heresy you quoted. Yeah. And, and from that, based on that awesome quote, I had to read all of her books. And uh, sooner than you know, now we publish eight or nine of her books. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then uh, a couple years ago, we came out with uh, Leon Gautier's Chivalry, based on your constant referencing of the book. It's a brilliant book. It's not my fault. <laughs> and so, I won't be blamed. And so now, the latest book, in the same manner, is uh, Sean Leslie's Ghost Book. Mm -mm. So I, I, th I think it is the perfect book for Catholics to read this Halloween season because it will make your Halloween more Catholic. And lest you think we're being a little premature, by this time, the last week in August, the Halloween decorations are already going up in some of the stores. Ah, uh, yes. And I, I should point out very quickly, today is the Feast of St. Louis, King of France, for all of us Frenchmen. Ooh. And it's also the Feast of St. Genesius, the patron of actors and comedians. Wow, there's one for you. Yeah, well, since my parents were actors and I was a comic, guess what? So it's a great day for me anyway. All right. Notice the fleur de lis time for the, the kings of France. Ah, uh, there you go. All right, uh, so by Shane Les uh, Sean Leslie, I'm sorry, it's spelled Shane, it's pronounced Sean. Shane! Shane! Oh, sorry, never mind. Not go ahead. No, not like that? Our, our generation's too young, I think, in general. They're not going to know old-timey Westerns. All right, never mind. I, I, I never liked Sha uh, Shane. Sean. <laughs> you didn't mean mixed up. I never liked Sean. <laughs> All right, no, he means Shane is the Western, but you pronounce this man's name Sean, even though it's spelled the same. There you go. No, no one pronounces it Shane, however. Wow, that'd be weird. Yeah, I think so. Okay, so buy his book, and if you come up with any good questions related to it, send them on in. I'll be strongly relating uh, to questions on the book, or related to the book. Uh, it's our, available on our website, tumblrhouse.com, for $14. Uh, for you international folks, you'll be able to purchase it on Amazon. But, for those of you who live in the U.S. and who are distributists, like G.K. Chesterton and Hilaire Belloc, you better be buying it from tumblrhouse.com. You buy it from Amazon, <laughs> You turn in your distributor's membership card right now. Uh, buying for, supporting small businesses is, is how distributors uh, can make an impact on this world, and I, I don't think they should, they should neglect that, that opportunity. No, well, it's the difference between Starbucks and uh, Ma Grissom's Common <laughs> Grounds, you know. Uh, of course, if you don't have any, co any local coffee house at all except Starbucks, I guess you're absolved, but unless you open one up yourself. Okay, for those of you who do want to buy the book from TumblrHouse.com, the link can be found in the summary for this video. All right, let's get started. So, uh, so Charles, what is, what is so important about this book? Uh, wh why should people read it? Because it is quite simply the best book on ghosts from the Catholic perspective that I have ever seen in a lifetime of reading. I actually came across it, believe it or not, in the rectory library of Immaculate Conception Church in beautiful Roswell, New Mexico, while I was going to beautiful New Mexico Military Institute, um, in the library of the pastor, Father Kevin Moynihan, God rest him. And I was immediately bowled over by it. It was, it was amazing. And in looking through it now, it's still amazing. It is. It is. It, it, it's you say it's the best book on ghosts from the Catholic perspective. Are there a lot of ghosts, or ghost books from the Catholic perspective? Uh, not so you notice. Uh, actually, most books about ghosts that you will read are written from various kinds of non-Catholic perspectives, uh, from um, spiritualists 
and uh, fund Protestant fundamentalists, um, or just books of random ghost stories. You know, very often you'll see things like uh, hauntings of San Benito County or something if you're you know for tourists. Uh, but in terms of uh, things that deal with the phenomenon seriously from a Catholic theological perspective, I don't think I've ever seen anything like it. Yeah, so there's no other book like this? No. No. Okay. Um, you provided a blurb for the book. And, yeah, you provided a blurb. Um, I did. Can I read it? If you like. It's a free country. Ghosts are big business today in radio, on television, and all over the internet. They always have been, from the Bible's account of Samuel's ghost to the present. But what is a Catholic to make of all of this? How do ghosts fit in with heaven, hell, and purgatory? Famous author and Catholic convert of the Chesterton Belloc era, uh, Sean Leslie, not only guides us authoritatively uh, through the church's teaching on ghosts and the afterlife, he tells some pretty chilling and true tales of hauntings. Not even priests are immune to the eruption of the unseen. Quite simply, the best book in English from the Catholic perspective. There you go. So, but... I stand by every word I wrote. <laughs> oh, you wrote a couple more words on it. Uh, you uh, were uh, generous enough to also write the foreword, a foreword for the book. Yeah. And uh, in the foreword, uh, one of the things you answered is why Sean Leslie is such a big name. Uh, a lot of people out there are probably wondering why he received the honor of getting his name incorporated into the title of the book. Uh, could you explain to our audience why Sean Leslie is a big deal? I sure could. Uh, he was a draw when he wrote, that's why the, the publishers put his name on it. He was a convert of the Chesterton Bellock era, he knew both of them. World War I uh, vet. He lived into the 70s, I think. Um, he was a convert. Now, he was Anglo-Irish. Now, for those of you who don't know what that means, the Anglo-Irish are the English who settled in Ireland as part of the conquest of the country by the British, by the English, specifically. Um, and they were the larger part of the um, ascendancy, the British rulership over the island. Uh, the nobles, the baronets, and so on. Now, mind you, there was also a native Gaelic aristocracy that has still survived to a piece, to, to a degree, some of them. But these folks were the biggest part of it uh, after Cromwell and William of Orange were finished with the island. Uh, but Sir Sean, who was born John, converted to Catholicism and became an Irish nationalist. Uh, but he held on to his home, Castle Leslie in County Monaghan. And the interesting thing, his father, also Sir John, was the uh, Lord Lieutenant of the county, which in the British setup, the Lord Lieutenant is sort of the head of the county structure. It's mostly ceremonial, but he has a certain amount of responsibility toward the militia and drilling and things mm -hmm. like that. So during the Troubles, uh, the Leslies, unlike a lot of the Anglo-Irish, were you, were always pretty popular with the locals. So one morning during the Troubles, about 1921, Sir John was having his breakfast. He looked across the little lake there at uh, Castle Leslie, and he saw troops drilling. And he thought, well, I'm the Lord Lieutenant of the county. If there's going to be any drilling, I shall inspect them. <laughs> so the chauffeur pulled out the car. He hopped in the limousine, drove around the lake, hopped out. The commandant of the camp saluted smartly. He reviewed the troops, got back in, drove back. It was the local battalion of the IRA. <laughs> wow. Oh, uh, oops. Oops. <laughs> on both sides. <laughs> but, you know, nobody, nobody made any comment about the fact. But uh, Castle Leslie was spared when a lot of the great houses were burned down. Uh, at any rate, uh, Sir Sean made quite a name for himself uh, as a writer, and he wrote on a huge... Uh, a huge variety of subjects, um, fiction and nonfiction, both. So by the time he wrote this book in the 50s, he was very well known to the Catholic audience in Britain and to some degree in the United States. Um, there was a publishing house in the United States in those days called Sheed and Ward. And they were uh, Frank Sheed and Maisie Ward. Frank Sheed was an Australian apologist, Maisie Ward was English. Uh, but they specialized in bringing English Catholic literature to the American Catholic audience. 
So they, they had begun as an English publishing house, but they moved to New York City. And they... They were the Catholic publishing company. They sure were. They sure were, especially in this country after they came over. Yeah. And they, um, um, they were very, very well known. And so, as I say, when the book came out, saying Sean Leslie's ghost book was a huge selling point. And honestly, I hope that this, if you read this and if you like it, I hope this will um, inspire you to explore his other stuff. I, I don't know if you just mentioned, maybe you did and, and I, uh, I missed it, but um, in the forward you also say he's uh, Winston Churchill's cousin. Yes, this is true. Uh, his mother was the sister of Churchill's mother, both American, the Jerome sisters. So he was very much at the center I mean, on the one hand, he was an Irish nationalist, but he was also at the center of the British establishment. And he was Anglo-Irish. And he was a convert. I mean, <laughs> you know, it, it's kind of funny because he comes from such a prestigious family. He's got friends in high places, Hilaire Bella, G.K. Chesterton. And then he writes a book on ghosts, which isn't the most prestigious topic well, in the world. It's not here and now, but it was when he was writing. Also, Castle Leslie is pretty well haunted. You know, oh. he doesn't talk about it in the book, but oh. uh, his uh, granddaughter, whom I had the pleasure of meeting at Castle Leslie, uh, filled me in on some of the ghost tales there. Oh, and and the, it's, it's, a, it's a very pleasant house, but it has its spooky side. Uh, there, there's a bed that nobody will sleep in because of the odd things that happen and this sort of stuff. Uh, Is she used to it? It's just, it's just, just playing. Yeah. Well, you find with people who live in haunted houses where they actually, where things do go bump in the night. You get used to it. You get used to it and you leave. You know, mm. it's, it's the same with haunted hotels, haunted uh, private clubs, haunted restaurants. You adjust, you get out. Um, I've known many, uh, many such establishments and the, the employees, the longtime employees have gotten used to it. They'll, they'll curl your hair, you know, very matter-of-factly. Yeah, you know, it took some getting used to. <laughs> yeah, <I'll> bet. <laughs> it's just, you, you really don't want to be in here on Thursday nights after midnight. It's okay the rest of the week, but after midnight, forget it. <laughs> Great, thanks for sharing. <laughs> oh, uh, none of us ever open up locker number four. You never know what you're going to see. That's terrible. Oh, man. Okay. Um. <laughs> yeah, it's... it's mm. Okay, now, let's say that I was a person that said to you, the church has never endorsed the idea of ghosts, and nowhere in the Bible does it ever mention anything about ghosts. What would you say to me? I'd say you've never read the Bible. <laughs> uh, for starters, we have the, uh, the witch of Endor. And, uh, uh, Who is she? She was a witch, oddly enough, who lived in a place called Endor but, in Palestine, okay. and she raised the ghost of the prophet Samuel at the request of King Saul. Okay. Because Saul wanted to, for, to learn the future, whether what the outcome of a battle that was coming up. So she raised Samuel from the dead. Wow. That, uh, that, that, that's, okay, a witch doing that? Raising Samuel from the dead? That's like necromancy. It's not like necromancy. It, well, okay, sorry. It is necromancy. It's so we have like, necromancy in the Bible. You sure do. Wow. It's not, it's not approved. It's not saying it's a good no, thing. No, of course, but just, wow. Uh, similarly, when uh, our Lord appears to the, the apostles after the crucifixion, he uh, is quick to assure them that he is not a ghost. Oh, really? Yeah, and you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be saying I'm not a ghost unless they had some knowledge of ghosts. <laughs> you know, that makes sense. Uh, yeah. I mean, otherwise, I'm not a giraffe. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> very, very nice for you. Yeah, I I'm, see. I'm glad you're not a giraffe, actually. To be honest with you, many as a giraffe, no. Just so you know. Okay. All right. So, okay. Um. And as, as far as the church goes, read the book. <laughs> uh, because he deals, uh, Sir Sean, in the first part of the book, deals a great deal with the church fathers who wrote about, like, St. Augustine, who wrote about hauntings, St. Thomas Aquinas, mm. uh, you know, in terms of the church having a defined teaching, yeah. no. But in terms of um, the father, of various fathers and doctors writing about it, and eminent theologians, oh yes. Okay. Um, 
So we've got a couple different types of ghosts that we deal with uh, in different stories. In the book. In, in Sean Leslie's book. Uh, we've got some ghosts that are repulsed by the sacraments, uh, by the rite of exorcism. Uh, we all know about these ghosts. Uh, but we've also got ghosts that want and seek out the sacraments uh, in various ways. Isn't that fascinating? Well, it is. Uh, these are souls in purgatory who want prayers or masses offered for them. Uh, if you go to Rome at the Church of Sacro Cuore del Suffragio, you'll see a collection of items that have been burned by these returnees from beyond. You'll also find a similar object in the treasury of the cathedral in Bratislava, Slovakia. I know because I've seen both of these with these eyes. Um, spirits do return from the dead. That is the church's experience. It may not be her teaching, in the sense that she teaches the Trinity and the Assumption, but it is her experience. It, it seem, it, ghosts do seem to coincide nicely uh, with the Catholic belief of purgatory. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, uh, this book, you know, we, it deals with the first two we've just mentioned, but the, uh, it also deals with ghosts that are unresponsive to the sacraments, which is sort of particular, isn't it? Or peculiar, isn't it? Well, those sorts of ghosts, see, he divides, uh, following prior theologians, he divides uh, the thing first into two kinds of hauntings. Those where there appears to be intelligence, those where there does not. Oh. Where there appears to be an intelligence, he then further separates into spirits from purgatory, uh, damned souls, and demons masquerading as the dead. Those are the kind that you can drive away with holy water and exorcisms and so forth. And those latter two, although there is a difference between them, Neither of them mean well by you, just to remember that. But then the other division are apparitions, hauntings, where there does not appear to be any intelligence present. Mm. You know, uh, oh, they do see the ghost of Lady Marjorie every third Friday walking through the long chamber. And you can throw rocks at her and she'll never notice. She just does the same thing all the time. Well, it's like a movie mm. that is getting constantly replayed. Yeah. And seemingly without any deep significance except to spook you if you see it. Yeah. Now, it is speculated, and this is not doctrinal speculation, that in some places, for reasons we do not know, particular scenes get impressed upon the atmosphere of the room and will, given the right circumstances, replay. Uh, I don't know, of course. I've never seen that kind of a thing myself, but I will say that it seems to me to be weirdly akin to another phenomenon, which we know happens, which is that sometimes when things will happen in front of a pane of glass, when lightning strikes, mm -hmm. whatever is happening will appear on the glass like a photograph. We don't know what that is. That. Yeah. We don't know why it happens, but it does happen from time to time. Uh, so there was at least one famous case of a murder that was solved by that means. Because it so happened that uh, the murder took place, lightning struck, wow. froze the scene on the glass. And then uh, later on, you know, the wrong person was accused. And then later on, through the testimony of the glass, they were able to figure out who had actually done it. You're telling me that they put this as evidence in a court of law? I am telling you just that. Where? In, in, uh, in Great in, Britain? No, no, in the United States. It was in wow. North Carolina or somewhere. I read about it in one of the WPA guides to the United States, so that's how I know. And it was, the, the piece of glass in the question was set in the courthouse afterwards. Wow. So you could stare at it. What, what, when was this? I would have to look that up on my... Uh, approximate, I mean, is it 20th uh, century? Yeah, uh, late 19th or early 20th. Wow. That's amazing. It's a, well, you know what Edward D. Wood Jr. said, life is a strange place in which to live. He proved it. I mean, anyway, what's, what do we got? Gosh, how many... Wow, we went way too many episodes without an Ed, Ed Wood quote from you. Ah, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, you know, and, and to think that last week was Criswell's birthday. <laughs> uh, yeah, and to think. Uh, okay. Um, now, in, in this book, one of the unusual things that uh, may make some people's eyebrows rise is the discussion of mediums. Uh, Leslie seems to treat them with great respect, 
despite saying that 90% of them are frauds. Um, he says, the little Therese of Lisieux was also a high medium, in quotes. Um, I'm going to read a little passage here uh, on uh, Sean Leslie's, uh, what he means by medium. He says, a, a medium in its simplest sense is a bridge, a connection, an invisible passage or influence between the unseen and the seen, between minds disembodied and minds still in the body. The Holy Scripture can be a medium between God and man. Likewise, every true prophet and every saint, though the gifts which blessed and unhallowed mediums share do not necess necessarily appear in every saint's existence, it is difficult to think of prophets who do not possess the mediumistic gift of foretelling the future. Even the witch of Endor, through the means of her control, caused Samuel to relate the immediate future with agonizing accuracy. So, do you, do you agree with uh, Leslie's position on mediums and, and what they are? Well, I, I mean, again, it's a question of semantics, a question of language. Uh, most, for most people, I mean, obviously his definition of medium is not one most of us are familiar with. Yeah, my, my, what I, I regard as medium is like Whoopi Goldberg from the movie Ghost. Yeah, that, <laughs> that is certainly the, the common today, is certainly the common yeah. view of what a medium is. It's like a trance medium, a spiritualist medium, the, the uh, a ringleader of a seance. And that's how most people think of medium. Yeah. But of course, in the sense that he is defining it, yeah. So, mm. But this is why, ladies and gentlemen, words are so important, and you can't always be sure that you mean the same thing by what someone else does. Because if you meant by our normal everyday way of saying medium, that St. Therese was a medium, you know, that's not true. Yeah. If you mean it in the sense that Sashan means it, it is. Similarly, the sacraments and magic. You know, if you look at every, the everyday idea of ceremonial magic as uh, uh, magicians or, or Wiccans uh, doing spells and all that, then to say that the sacraments and magic sounds like absolute blasphemy and sacrilege. However, if by magic you mean what the uh, medievals meant by it, the accomplishment of ends out of all proportion of the uh, means used, then it's the highest magic there is. So much depends on the definition that you attach to words. Um, same with symbols. That's why, you know, the eye and the pyramid that today we take as a Masonic symbol yeah. was originally a perfectly useful and true Catholic symbol for the Trinity. Wow. Which is why Father Sarah had the eye of the uh, triangle on so many of his chasubles that you'll see around California in the museums. But when I bring out of town as out of staters to see them and they see the eye of the pyramid on the back of Father Sarah's chasuble, they're like, oh my God, what's that there for? <laughs> He's Illuminati. <laughs> well, I, what I was telling is, you see, California was a Masonic plot from the very beginning. Uh, and this is why, ladies and gentlemen, um, and this is an aside, but yeah. when you're going to any of these areas, when someone, when you see a symbol and someone using it, or you hear a word used, and your initial response is shock and horror, before you let yourself go completely irrational, try to figure out if that person assigned the same meaning to the word or the symbol that you do. Because it may not. If he doesn't, then you're getting all upset over nothing, and possibly losing the ability to learn something. Which would make you very modern. I mean, that that's good. You know, you'd be in, in, in fashion anyway. But uh, it probably wouldn't help you very much in terms of objective reality. Much as we had to sh hate to shed reality on any issue. Let alone this area. It's too much like hard work, Charles. I know. I'm sorry. <sighs> what else we got? Uh, uh, Sean Leslie, um, he, he goes on to say that St. John Vianney was also a medium. In that he would he would constantly battle devils. Uh, could you talk about Saint John Vianney a little bit and explain some of his encounters with the spiritual world? Um, he sounds like someone who'd be an effective medium. He's got no imagination, grounded, and it sort of it sort of reminds me of the exorcist that you know. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. <laughs> very true. Uh, well, Saint John Vianney uh, was tormented by a thing he called the grappin. And it would throw, it was a demon. You know, it would throw things around. It was like a poltergeist, only nastier. And would occasionally speak, which most poltergeists don't do. 
it, it, it was a real annoyance for him, but he'd make fun of it and laugh at it and all that kind of thing. Um, and yes, with the exorcists that I've known and those that I've read about, they do have that in common with them, was that a, seem, a, a singular lack of imagination. And that's a very important thing, because if you're going to be dealing with the demonic, you don't want to have a vivid imagination. Yeah. Like, yeah. It could play on it, you see. For us, it would be like, oh my gosh, there's a demon. And for him, it's like, look at this look at, demon look over here. Look at here. the moron. Look at, look at this guy over here, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Grappin, believe me when I tell you it's not a compliment. <laughs> he gave it a stupid little nickname and made fun of it. I, I, I'm getting mixed up in my sense. Who's the saint that got beat up by the devil? Was that Padre Pio or is that St. John Vianney? St. John Vianney got beat up. He oh, got smacked around. Wow. But uh, Padre Pio might have as well. But St. John Vianney, uh, but it, it didn't bother him. He didn't let it deflect him because he was focused on God. And had a very, I mean, one of his gifts was the gift of discernment of spirits. Now, what that means uh, is that he could tell good spirits from evil. But he had another gift. If you went into the confessional, he could tell you your sins. And if you hid one, he would let you. He would remind you as to what you were hiding. Mm. Uh, for all that, he was a very tender confessor. But you didn't want to play games. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, saint John Vianney, he, because he was a simple saint. He was a yeah. very simple guy. And, um, he, was, uh, he was not, he was not uh, a tremendous intellectual. He wasn't uh, given to flights of fancy. He didn't have, as I say, a great imagination. And, I, and mind you, the people saw the things going on around. Yeah. He didn't say much about it on his own, but people would observe it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he, uh, you know, it's important to know a great deal of the faith in order to defend it. But at the same time, I feel sometimes we over-intellectualize everything. And sometimes I wonder how beneficial it would be to sometimes have the perspective of simpler saints, like St. Saint John Vianney. Uh, I think this type of approach is, is how you become a child of God, totally trusting, totally dependent. Um, you know, what, what is your take on that, you know, this, this simple approach versus perhaps a more intellectual, philosophical approach? Well, I mean, obviously, one of the great uh, reasons for the uh, difficulties of the Church in our time has been our reduction of the faith to a, a set of intellectual propositions. Mm. And that, you know, that's a, a bad thing. Yeah. But you do need both. Ah. You see, you need the faith of a St. John Vianney, and you need the intellectuality of a St. Thomas Aquinas. You need them both in tandem. Uh, you know, it's not like, well, uh, is he Bonaventure or St. Thomas? Which one? No? Both. <laughs> uh, Aristotle versus Plato? Uh, both. Byzantine versus Latin? Ooh. Both. Ah. The totality is necessary. It's what Mutatis Mutandis, it's um, St. John Paul II's... Uh, Comparison of East and West as breathing with both lungs. Both yes, I love that. Because these different things act as correctives on each other's excesses. Mm. See, remember, we're dealing, basically, when we're dealing with the faith, we're dealing with what is, humanly speaking, un inexplicable. You just can't do it. Yeah. But we have to try. However, being human, our attempts will fail, and they'll fail according to our own personal... Uh, personality shifts our own manner of being. And so the insights of those who do not share those are necessary. We correct them, they correct us. Uh, you're, you're very, very uh, mystical and you go off into the netherworld. <laughs> I'm all about social justice and Ooh. I demand that there be freedom now. Well, we both, we're both needed. Without me, you're gonna, you're, your faith is going to be totally irrelevant. And without you, mine is going to be completely unreligious. It has to be in tandem. Gosh, there's a lot of people who don't want to hear that. We need social justice warriors? We do need social justice warriors, but they have to be doing it for the sake of the kingdom. Ah, there we go. Okay. That's, and this, this goes back. In other words... Um, 
our, our model is not Marx, but Christ. Ah, yes. That's the thing. Uh, and sometimes it's difficult to make these distinctions, you know? Especially if we're trying to accomplish something specific, we need allies. Sometimes those allies don't share our first principles. Right. Um, and it doesn't have to be social justice. I mean, it's the same with pro-life, which is part of social justice. Uh, and it's easy for social justice warriors to forget that, just as it's easy for pro-life people to forget it. But for the opposite reasons, you understand? <laughs> That's why they're both needed. Yeah. <laughs> you, I mean, uh, the, the, the Catholic worker should never forget that justice includes right to life. But right to lifers also need to remember that the life that everyone has a right to should be worth living. Mm. Yeah. I mean, we, 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 and our tendency is to focus upon our little bit yeah. to the neglect of the whole. We can't do that. Because when we do that, we make our little thing an idol. We cut it off from everything else. I mean, uh, it's, uh, you, you, can, you can do this for anything. You can do this with the arts. You can do this with music. Yeah. And I'm speaking specifically of church music, uh, church art, church history. Yeah. You know, uh, you can make everything an end in itself. But none of these things are intended to be. And they're all meant to be connected. Ideally, if someone like, oh, I don't know myself, is working in church history, he should be doing it with the goal of making it easier thereby for his fellow Catholics to lead a Catholic life and save their souls. And ditto everything else. Yeah. Just given whatever the person's specific interest and or discipline might be. Yeah. Okay. Even ghosts. Yep. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, final question. Yes, sir. Uh, so... You know, the ghost book centers on, on real, real life ghost stories in the United Kingdom. Uh, I've always been under the impression that on the West Coast, we don't have too many ghosts. On the East Coast, we have a little bit more ghosts. Uh, in the United Kingdom, they're loaded with ghosts. Uh, and I always, I always believe, perhaps falsely, that this was because we live in the New World that doesn't have too much history. United Kingdom is from the old world that has a lot of history, a lot of death, a lot of opportunities for ghosts, I guess you could say. Um, what? Ghost to haunt house. <laughs> <laughs> Halloween through Christmas. <laughs> Part time available. <laughs> okay. Um, Only work nights. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um, so, is is my impression? Is that fair to say, or is that totally wrong? That's totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> California okay. be crawling with ghosts. Oh, oh no. No, oh, yes, they everywhere's. Uh oh. No, no. I mean, you you can uh, you you have ghost hunting societies in every every square corner of this of this state of ours. Oh no. Uh, the the fabulous Aztec Hotel up there on, on Foothill Boulevard is is, is supposedly crawls. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. I mean, you go to any tourist oriented store, and there'll be books about local ghosts throughout this great land of ours, from the east coast to the west. <laughs> This land is their land. This land is their land. Anyway, uh, no, no, no. Every every area has ghost stories. Um, it's interesting that uh, Stephen King was inspired to write The Shining uh, because he thought he saw a ghost. Oh yeah, in uh, in the, the Colorado. Yeah, yeah. In the hotel in Colorado. Stanley Hotel. The yeah. Stanley. He he saw a little girl, and so that inspired him. She turned into twins, and uh, that was the shining. The the um, a ghost show I used to watch, Ghost Hunters. They did an episode on on Stanley Hotel. That place is crazy. That place is seriously haunted. Well, it's, uh, as is the billboard downtown LA. Oh no. Oh yes. I want to think that the ghosts are far away from me in other states, not like across the street. Isn't that your aunt Matilda? No, don't don't no. do that. You know, ghosts for some people, it's sort of like Jaws. 
you know, like, uh, like Jaws, uh, like, uh, I like, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, with, with Jaws, it's like, okay, I'm scared to, to go in the water because I'm afraid that I'll be eaten by a shark. But ghosts, it's worse because with ghosts, it's like, okay, I'm scared to be in my room late at night alone because then a ghost will eat me. <laughs> well, if it makes you feel better, I don't think any ghost anywhere has ever eaten anyone, so you're safe. But I, I always think of this uh, French lady, I think her name was Defon, Defron, something like that, or Gaffon, anyway, whatever her name was, she ran a salon in Paris where some of the brightest wits of the day would gather. And she was asked once, uh, Madame, what do, you, what do you think of ghosts? She says, oh, I don't believe in them, of course, but I'm very much afraid of them. That doesn't make any sense. That yeah, does. <laughs> because, you see, we like to control our environment. And ghosts, in a weird way, represent a lack of control. Mm. Um, and if you ever have a ghostly encounter, you once it's over, you will immediately begin trying to figure out a way to explain it away to yourself. See, that, that's why I like this book so much, because, because it combats this scientific rationalism that has infected a lot of people. We want to dissect everything. What does this mean? What exactly is this? Who knows? And, and with ghosts... You just have to accept it. You don't know the rules and just no, take it. You know, and that that is one of the great things, not just for hauntings, but for life in general. Uh, anything to do with the, the supernatural, as we call the things of God, and the preternatural, yeah. as we call the other things. Um, why does Our Lady appear here and not there? Right. You, why are there Eucharistic miracles there and not here? Why was there something other here and not there? Right. Why was she healed at Lourdes, but yeah. he wasn't? Yeah. Well, M.R. James was quoted in the book, great ghost story writer himself. He was asked if he believed in ghosts, and his response covers not just ghosts, but everything like that. These things happen, depend upon it, but we do not know the rules. I love it. It's, we don't. And yeah. we can't. You shouldn't ha need this scientific approach to dissect heaven realities in order to believe in heavenly realities. Yeah, I mean, I am very happy and very much in favor of subjecting uh, miraculous healings or the supposed hosts turned to flesh and wine to blood to the most rigorous scientific testing yeah. possible. But that's the point. Once you get past testing whatever physical evidence there is, that's it. Yeah. You're left. You're done. And of course, when something happens to you and there is no physical evidence, um, it just happened. There's nothing more to be said. I uh, I should I should add though that it's always important to remember whether it be a demonic possession and re and requisite exorcism. Or Great Aunt Fanny walking through the green room at uh, at uh, twelve o'clock every Thursday night, or fairies dancing around the green. None of this stuff happens without God's permission. There is an intelligence at work. Nothing is random, especially mm -hmm. in this area. So, if you ever see a ghost, and 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 mind you, as he points out, we as Catholics are not allowed to seek them out in the sense of Ouija right. boards or seances or anything like that. Uh, the church does not allow us to conjure them. As far as our being allowed to see them, well, he makes the comment, you know, that's like saying, well, does the church allow us to see passing cars? You know, <laughs> wow. Things happen. Yeah. But uh, it's important to remember that there is an intelligence at the back of it all, and that intelligence desires our salvation. Uh, if all that happens after reading Sir Sean's book is you come away with the St. Benedict medal and the scapula around your neck and a holy water stoop in your house, he'll have done his part. And he'd be the first to say so, I think. All right, that's it for this episode. If this book sounds like something you'd be interested in, uh, please order from tumblrhouse.com. I can tell you we're definitely in need of financial support. So thank you, and we'll see you next time. And if you get an autographed copy of this one, <sighs> autographed by the author, 
That's pretty scary. That's, that's your own ghost story. Yeah. Till next time.